Imagine yourself as the Pope in the year 1600. You're the head of the one true faith, but all around you the enemies of God are closing in. The Balkans have been totally conquered by the Muslim Turks, most of Northern Europe has been lost to the Protestant Reformation, and religious violence seems to be becoming more common. Now, many popes before you have taken their own measures, some of which have been very successful. But were they enough? In 1622, Pope Gregory XV seemed to think that they weren't, and so he organized the first modern propaganda organization, the Sacra Congregatio de Propaganda Fide, more simply put, just Propaganda Fide. Pope Gregory gave the congregation immense powers, but with these powers came huge challenges. So the question then becomes, how did they do? And did Propaganda Fide have what it takes to succeed? Propaganda Fide didn't just come as a brilliant idea one of the popes had one day. It was the result of a massive change in the socio-political dynamics of Europe that unfolded over the 16th century. At times, this change was relatively quick, and at other times, it unfolded pretty slowly. Ultimately, thousands of people rejected the authority of the Catholic Church, and Christianity appeared to be more quarrelsome than ever. The heresies which had become mainstream during this time were rooted in very legitimate grievances. The Catholic Church was truly an arcane and poorly organized entity in which corruption was rife. Still, the Church had come under serious pressure. At times, they responded thoughtfully, and other times, not so much. Yet at the same time, new and exciting opportunities presented themselves to the faith. The New World and much of the Old had been open to Catholic missionaries by the colonial powers. It was a time of great pressures, but also great opportunities, and thus a pivotal moment in the Church, a moment which many energetic clergymen were looking to take advantage of. One such person was Ignatius de Loyola, who in 1540 founded the Society of Jesus, better known as the Jesuits. The Jesuits approached evangelization with a whole new zeal and regimentation which previously hadn't really existed. As a result, they were operating dozens of missions and colleges across three continents just a couple decades after their founding. Catholicism in Poland and Austria was also re-established largely thanks to their efforts. Later, between 1545 and 1563, an ecumenical council was held at Trent. Now, the Council of Trent is way too much to get into for the purposes of this video, but what you need to know is it had the effect of unifying the church, reigning in corruption, and establishing a new mandate for missionary work. In 1588, one particularly visionary pope named Sixtus V recognized that there was a desperate need to reform the Roman Curia, which is the administrative body of the church. Now, most church business was conducted by the pope, but Sixtus recognized that his workload was just way too high for him to handle. So he established 15 new cardinal congregations to help manage things. Each of them was their own bureaucracy, which was granted its own jurisdiction and its own powers that were relevant for it facilitating church business. It was these three factors which inspired Pope Gregory XV to create Propaganda Fide, which was another bureaucracy just like the ones before but this one was specifically designed to run missionary efforts across the globe. On June 22, 1622, Pope Gregory XV issued the papal bull Inscrutabili Divine Providentiae Arcano. Don't come after my Latin. Anyway, this bull's best understood by dividing it into five sections, each of which deals with their own different aspect of the organization. The first section laid out the reasons for the founding of Propaganda Fide. It essentially says that spreading the faith has always been the responsibility of us, the popes. And believe me, we did a really good job. But it's become way too much to handle, and so we need to delegate this work to a cardinal congregation. The second section determined the time and location of meetings, at least twice a month, but usually more. The leader of the congregation, called the cardinal prefect, would meet with the secretary and a couple other members in his private residence to address congregation business. The cardinal prefect had the authority to make decisions on regular issues then and there. For issues of higher importance, they were brought before the entire congregation, which would meet at least once a month. 
issues of the greatest importance would be brought directly to the Pope. The third section granted the powers and jurisdictions of the congregation. It's the most important part, so I'm going to quote directly from the text. Quote, Let them superintend all missions for the preaching and teaching of the gospel and Catholic doctrine and appoint and change the necessary ministers. We do also grant them full, free, and ample authority and power to transact and execute all business necessary or expedient for the good of the missions. In other words, Propaganda Fide was granted nearly unlimited authority over its jurisdiction, which incorporated a massive amount of territory. By today's standards, it was roughly two-thirds of the world. So you can see why I said it was an important part. The fourth section established how the congregation would be financed. Some of it came from a tax levied on new cardinals, some of it came from private donations, and some of it even came directly from the Pope's own treasury. The fifth section appointed the congregation's first members. Two of the most important members on this list were Maffeo Barberini, who later became Pope Urban VIII, and Francesco Ingoli, who was the first secretary. At first glance, you might think the Cardinal Prefect was the most powerful member on the congregation. After all, he had control over about two-thirds of the world and was even sometimes referred to as the Red Pope. But a closer examination will reveal the pure magnitude of the Secretary's power. It was his responsibility to collect and process information. He had massive influence in the weekly meetings with the Cardinal Prefect, and it was his job to take information and bring it before the Cardinal Assembly and explain it to everybody. Almost all information had at some point passed under his nose, which made him a considerable force to be reckoned with. With the congregation established, the Cardinals set out to change the world. They'd been given a direct mandate from the Pope, so in theory, exercising their authority should have been easy, right? Well, in reality, things didn't always work that way. The first main challenge was in collecting accurate information. It was vital for the Cardinals of Propaganda Fide to establish an accurate understanding of the world that they were trying to change. After they had done so, they could move on to the next big problem, overcoming institutional barriers. Most Catholic missions had been established by an independent religious order and were continued to be run by them. These included the Jesuits, the Franciscans, and the Dominicans, and more. It was important for Propaganda Fide to establish its authority over all of them all over the world. They also needed to overcome the system of patronage, which was established between the Vatican and the Catholic nations of Spain and Portugal. Patronage was established in the early days of colonialism to help convert native peoples. It granted broad authority over missionary activities in their territories. In exchange, the kingdoms had to provide support and protection to the missionaries. Propaganda Fide had just been granted the same powers over the same jurisdictions. It was clear this was going to be a point of conflict. And to gain an edge, Propaganda Fide also needed to navigate relations with the native kingdoms. His secretary, Francesco Ingoli, took it upon himself to tackle these issues. First, the information problem. Francesco Ingoli began sending letters requesting information from anybody and everybody who could tell him something new. In these letters, he requested information on local political situations, native cultures and traditions, native religions, the states of the missions, and much, much more. The first response he received was from Vittorio Acorense, who was the professor of Arabic and Chaldean languages at Sapienza University in Rome. He had studied the Middle East all his life and thus provided a report detailing as much information as he could. He also provided his thoughts on what made someone a good missionary and also on what Propaganda Fide needed to do to be successful. He reiterated over and over of the need to print texts in native languages and only send missionaries who were dedicated and interested in learning native customs and cultures. Soon after, reports began flooding in from all over. Many of the mission leaders gave glowing reports of their mission successes, which often lacked any semblance of self-criticism. These were usually followed up with requests for more funding. Keep in mind, many of these missions are run by proud men who all have their own agendas, which is reflected in the self-aggrandizing nature of these letters. 
Conversely, reports coming from outside the mission leadership often detailed starkly contrasting opinions. Such was the case with Antonio Albergati, the apostolic collector in Lisbon. Albergati lamented the lack of progress in the missions and blamed the leadership, especially the Portuguese officials. Quote, They have no fear of God and treat the natives cruelly, not caring about their conversion at all. The members of Portuguese religious congregations who go on missions are much more concerned with amassing wealth for their families than preaching the gospel. Albergati was highlighting one of the principal issues that existed under Portuguese patronage. They abused their power early and often for their own gain. A perfect example is their hostile takeover of the St. Thomas Christians in India. This was an independent sect of Syrian Christianity which, while not technically Catholic, was in line with Catholic doctrine. When the Portuguese established themselves in India, they illegitimately arrested and deported the leadership of the St. Thomas Christian Church for heresy. Doing so cut the St. Thomas Christians off from their religious leadership and brought them under the Portuguese patronage system. I'm sure their lucrative spice industry had nothing to do with this. The Vatican recognized the Portuguese were full of crap and sent the leaders back to India, only for them to be arrested again. This example perfectly captures the abject corruption of the Portuguese administration that men like Albergati were detailing. It was through these reports that Ingoli began formulating ideas. Now up to this point, it's clear that Ingoli was doing what it takes to be successful. He was trying to take advantage of existing cultural aspects and crystallize them or channel them into a useful direction for him. This is a core concept of propaganda. Movements are not created out of thin air, and you can't make something out of nothing. Ingoli attempting to acquire such a broad understanding of things is not only impressive, it was vital for Propaganda Fide's efforts. It was also how he formulated one of Propaganda Fide's most important missionary policies, indigenization. Now, the big question was how to actually implement this policy in the mission areas. The superiors general of the religious orders began issuing directives to missionary leaders, instructing them to begin integrating natives into the clergy and their orders. This was met with significant pushback from both the Iberian crowns and the mission leaders, which limited the progress of indigenization, especially in India and China. It was clear a workaround needed to be devised. The first thing they did was change the way missionaries were trained. In 1627, Pope Urban VIII issued a papal bull establishing the Collegium Urbanum, which was a seminary dedicated to training missionaries and was placed under the control of Propaganda Fide. This was a brilliant move because it gave the congregation direct control over the training of the people who were actually being sent into the field. Using it, the prospective missionaries could be taught the value of indigenization before being sent abroad. Propaganda Fide also supplemented this effort by establishing seminaries in local jurisdictions to help train native clergy. A second workaround was to establish ecclesiastical hierarchies. Most of the time when the faith was entering a new area with few Christians, a simple mission was established usually run by a religious order. When the mission grew large enough, it became possible to establish an apostolic prefecture run by a prefect. This is the first step in establishing a local church government that had a link directly to Rome rather than the independent religious order that previously ran the mission. Propaganda Fide could also appoint the prefect directly which was a right previously reserved by the Portuguese king. Thus, it was also circumventing the system of patronage. As the territory continued to grow, it could later become an apostolic vicariate run by a vicar, or even a diocese run by a bishop, which gave Propaganda Fide even more control over it. A final tool Propaganda Fide used was to take greater steps into the realm of international politics. To do this, they utilized a position called the Apostolic Nuncio, who was effectively a diplomat sent to a kingdom. There, he would establish an Apostolic Nunciature, which is effectively just a permanent embassy. Nuncios who were already working in 1622 were given new directives. First, 
they were to inform their hosts of the establishment of Propaganda Fide, what its objectives were, and what its nature was. Next, they were responsible for managing the opinions and expectations of the kings whose courts they were in. They were given further assignments to keep in touch with the missions and report back to Rome. In that last part, you can really see Ingoli's influence. These measures worked relatively well. I say that very cautiously because through all of this, the Portuguese were still a major thorn in the side of Propaganda Fide. They demanded missionaries take oaths of loyalty to the Portuguese crown, arrested priests who had entered India without their permission, and sometimes even expelled entire religious orders who they didn't like. It was obvious patronage was not going away quietly, but it's clear that other measures were working over time to establish more control over the religious orders and introduce a limited number of new indigenous clergymen. But this is where Propaganda Fide started running into trouble. The first Chinese clergyman to rise through the ranks was a man named Luo Wenzhou, who was also named Gregorio Lopez. Gregorio freaking Lopez. Am I the only one who really likes that name? When Zhao led an interesting life in the church, escaping persecution from Chinese authorities and rendering aid to thousands of others who were also facing persecution. His exploits made him famous, and in 1674 he was appointed the Apostolic Vicar of Nanjing. Wen Zhao was a diligent bishop, and he was noted for his zeal, but he was also controversial. He identified some major roadblocks obstructing missionary work and wrote to Rome criticizing their policies that had created this situation. Specifically, he lamented the fact that he had to use Latin language in mass and in liturgies. Wen Zhao's criticism was the perfect embodiment of what became known as the Chinese Rites Controversy, which was a conflict over how to translate Deus, the Latin word for God, into Chinese, whether or not to translate the Roman Missal into Chinese, whether it was appropriate to venerate ancestors in the Chinese custom, and how much of Confucianism could be tolerated and incorporated into the Catholic faith. The benefits of allowing these things would have been speedy conversion and more indigenous clergy. However, by the 1670s, Francesco Ingoli had been dead for some time, and Propaganda Fide was reticent to make any concessions. The reason was because Rome did not have timely or sophisticated means of translating from Latin to Chinese. Thus, if they allowed for Chinese liturgies, it would be almost impossible for them to identify and react to any potential heresies. So, when Zhao's petitions were denied over and over again, and decades of simmering tensions ensued between the East and West. In the early 1700s, Pope Clement XI ascended to the papacy. He had been a member of Propaganda Fide, and thus he recognized the importance of dealing with the Chinese rights controversy. To deal with it, he appointed a competent and decorated man named Charles Thomas Maillard de Tournon as the first apostolic nuncio to the Qing Empire. His mission was first and foremost to establish a nunciature in China which would create what he called a direct correspondence to Rome. Next, he was to aid in the directing of missionary activities in the region and navigate relations with the Portuguese. Tournon arrived in China and immediately got into rough waters. He petitioned for a meeting with the Kangxi Emperor and was denied until his representative quite literally got on his hands and knees and begged. When he was finally granted the meeting, Tornan pleaded his case for establishing a direct correspondence. The Emperor asked for clarification on what it meant to establish a correspondence in this manner. Tornan responded that only a person with the Pope's confidence could represent him in such a way and that European courts actually found this correspondence to be highly useful. The emperor was irked by this response, and he responded, China has nothing in common with the West. I tolerate you for your religion, and you for your part should not worry about anything other than your soul and your doctrine. Every Westerner in China is capable of writing and receiving papal correspondence of the type that you talked about. I do not know what you mean when you talk about a man who has the Pope's confidence." Ternan tried to explain that any random Jesuit translator was simply not competent enough nor authorized to represent the Pope. 
The Kangxi Emperor did not like this answer and again admonished her not. Who would I give a charge to if they were not loyal to me? Who among you would dare to deceive the Pope? Your religion forbids you from lying. Whoever lies offends God. He then dismissed Ternan and advised him to leave the capital immediately. So Ternan left for Macau, where he was detained by Portuguese officials and placed under house arrest, where he would die five years later. Thus again, illustrating the difficulties that Propaganda Fide had in overcoming the system of patronage. Ternan's legation to China was a total embarrassment in soured relations between Rome and Beijing. Not long after, Pope Clement published a papal constitution which effectively settled the Chinese rights controversy, but not in the way you might expect. Instead of allowing for liturgies in the Chinese language, translations were banned. Instead of allowing for the veneration of ancestors, they were also banned. Instead of incorporating certain aspects of Confucianism, Eastern customs were denounced. The Kangxi Emperor was enraged by this decision, and in turn, he banned Christian missionaries from entering the country, so good job. It wasn't until the mid-20th century when these bans were reciprocally lifted. So how do we go about rating Propaganda Fide as a propaganda organization? Let's start with the good. The first genius of Propaganda Fide can be found in its organization. It was a clear effort to establish a propaganda arm of the government of the church, which was a revolutionary feat. The utilization of apostolic hierarchies to assert control and gather information was also brilliant. Lastly, Ngoli's indigenization policy and his obsession with gathering information and understanding local cultures and customs was absolutely the right move. Now onto the bad. First, they had very limited success in navigating the system of royal patronage. Sure, they were able to establish various dioceses and vicariates which gave Propaganda Fide greater control over those jurisdictions, but the Portuguese continued to leverage their own powers to confound and restrict these efforts. In order to get around these restrictions, Propaganda Fide tried to pit other colonial powers such as England and the Netherlands against Portugal. However, lots of times they were simply being used to undermine Portuguese power and advance the interests of these other nations. What can I say, they weren't one of the big dogs in the room. Often, they were simply a tool in another man's game. Then, we got to address the elephant in the room, which is Propaganda Fide totally bungling the indigenization policy. Their efforts started out on the right path, but quickly derailed as soon as they had to answer any difficult questions about their China policy. And really, Propaganda Fide's difficulty in overcoming the Chinese rights controversy is a perfect example of how religions fail in a modern propaganda context. Here's the thing. The concerns about rising heresies coming from translated texts was totally justified, as was their reluctance to integrate certain Confucian customs. Overall, Catholicism, from a theological perspective, is probably incompatible with many of these Chinese cultural customs, and this illustrates the fundamental catch-22 that religions find themselves in. In order to thrive in a modern world, religion needs to create effective propaganda. But in order to create effective propaganda, they need to abandon certain aspects of their faith which are incompatible with it. This makes them look weak and in turn negates the effects of the propaganda. It's a catch-22 with no way out. To illustrate this, if you enter the political realm of propaganda, you almost never see a propagandist grappling with whether or not some cultural aspect is compatible with their ideology. They simply do. In fact, a good propagandist will often embrace contradiction as a tool for furthering their objectives. This is simply something religion cannot do. If it does, it undermines its own core concept. So overall, I give Propaganda Fide a 3 out of 10. Two for their efforts and one because they actually introduced the word propaganda in our modern lexicon, which is kind of cool. It was ultimately a noble attempt to create a propaganda organization that ended up falling flat on its face and exposing serious incompatibilities. So leave a comment down below letting me know what you think and what you would rate Propaganda Fide. Don't forget to check out the Patreon where you can support me, and there's also a Discord for you to check out. Leave a like, subscribe, hit the bell, blah blah blah, you know the drill. Have a good day!